Hi gang, so this is um, a reaction video to uh, Eric Dubay's video on what happens to you when you die. Uh, it's called something like um, the something or other deception, the afterlife deception. And I quite like uh, the work of Eric Dubay. Uh, he says some really great things, but I think uh, he's, he's on a trend at the moment. Uh, doing these videos about the afterlife and the afterlife deception and that when you die about uh, being deceived and that these beings of light come and, you know, they, they tell you how wonderful it is, but basically it's all a deception of some kind. And I'm not really quite sure what point Eric is trying to make, but my feeling is that, you know, he's uh, making some errors and I think because he's got such a big following, in the millions that I think I feel I must uh, maybe offer some corrections if I may be so arrogant as to say, uh, just based on experience and uh, knowledge. So basically myself, I've, I've worked as a clairvoyant most of my life. I ran a spiritualist church. I've uh, written uh, books on spiritualism, psychic and spiritual awareness. I understand about auras and energies and the afterlife. And I've communicated with spirit, um, which, if I may just put forward at the start, Eric is not a clairvoyant. He's not sat and communed or spoke with spirits. He's not brought them through for anyone. And so there are deficiencies. And I, I get people like, um, Eric Dubé, who make judgments, you know, and they, they kind of put out hypotheses on things, you know, ideas on things that really are orientated from a kind of an outside point of view. You know, you haven't had that experience. You haven't spoken with spirit. You haven't met with beings from other worlds and communed with them, whereas I have. So in that sense, I'm just jumping in as a, a kind of, um, not a criticism or anything, but just, uh, now, first of all, the, the, he's chosen this episode of Star Trek Next Generation, which, you know, I'm, I'm not a big Trekkie sort of, uh, I don't, you know, I like the Star Trek, the original series from 1967, season one, uh, season two, season three, maybe not, not so much. Next Generation didn't really watch it all that much. But one thing in its favor is that it's proper science fiction in that it's set in space because it needs to be set in space because you're dealing with interdimensional creatures and time travel and conspicuous technology and things that, you know, go beyond the limits of what we can currently experience at the moment. So it, it deserves to be in space. Whereas, And I say that because some sci-fi you look at and, you know, it could just be like an episode of EastEnders or something. So what kind of day have you had down at the, uh, down in the, in the loading bay? Uh, how's the wife and kids doing over on their talk on six? Nothing about monsters and time travel and all the things that we expect from sci-fi. So now this episode is to do with um, <clears throat> one of the starship captains, Kate, wherever her name is. I never really watched the series, so uh, you'll have to just uh, forgive my half bakedness. Um, she encounters a figure who pretends to be her father in this, so let's just go with it. During an episode titled Coda from season three of the popular science fiction show Star Trek Voyager, Captain Catherine Janeway is directly confronted with a reincarnation soul trap matrix. After having their shuttle struck by ion lightning in space, oh, don't you just hate it when that happens? The captain and her co-pilot begin experiencing a time loop, where every time they seem about to perish, oh, not a time loop again. The sci-fi series, what a brilliant device! They instantly revert. So I won't be interrupting like that too often. I just can't help it. Back to the moment just before being struck. Janeway slowly starts recognizing this incessant déjà vu and begins to worry that she may have died. In reality, they had crash-landed on an alien world where her body lay dying, where her consciousness was having a near-death experience. Suddenly, somehow back on the Starship Enterprise, out of a bright white light steps Captain Janeway's long-deceased father, smiling 
and in full captain's uniform. "'Who are you? Are you responsible for what's going on here?' she asks him sternly. "'You know who I am, Catherine,' he responds. She shakes her head. "'My father died over fifteen years ago. You may be a hallucination, or some kind of projection of my own imagination, but you are not my father.' The entity insists that he is indeed her father, and that she died in a shuttle crash. He claims to understand her confusion, and to have gone through the same feelings when he passed away, explaining, I went back to you, your mother, and your sister after I died for a long time, until I realized it was futile. That's what happens when death is unexpected. One's consciousness isn't prepared to let go. Still skeptical, she quips back, Consciousness? Is that what you're calling me? Catherine's consciousness? For want of a better word, he answers. Some say ghost or spirit. We all heard the stories, and thought they were the product of vivid imaginations or self-induced hysteria. I'll admit, I was surprised when I found out they were true. Catherine continues to test the entity claiming to be her father by asking questions only he should know. He answers convincingly, and details her family's actions during the days after his death, insisting that he was there in spirit, watching over her, her sister, and her mother. Eventually, you will cross over, he says. The only question is how long it will take you to give up this world. Cross over to where, she asks. I don't know what to call it, he replies. Another state of consciousness, unlike anything we ever could have imagined in life. It's not a frightening place, Catherine. It's full of joy and indescribable wonder. Captain Janeway's father leads her to a room on the Starship Enterprise, where the crew are now holding her funeral. After the final speaker finishes their last teary, heartfelt goodbye, her father interjects, It's over now, Catherine. There's nothing left for you here. Come with me. What do I do to leave here? she asks. Just decide he answers. The only thing that keeps you is your refusal to leave. Catherine acknowledges that she simply isn't ready to accept it, and wishes to stay in spirit with her friends and crew. Her father responds, You're saying all the things I told myself when I refused to leave you. I was hoping you wouldn't have to go through that. It's a horrible existence, Catherine. As time wears on, you begin to see how potent, how destructive loneliness is. You'll see the people you love going on with their lives, doing all the things you used to share with them, but you won't be a part of it anymore. You'll forever be shut out of their existence. It becomes agonizing. I don't want that to happen to you. You can only be an observer of their lives, never a participant. Every hour you stay here makes it that much more difficult to leave. Defiant and unyielding, Catherine sternly snaps back, saying, I don't care. I'd rather be here in spirit than not at all. A captain doesn't abandon ship. Why are you pushing me? I've made up my mind. I'm staying here. Then, just as she makes this decision, her dying body lying on the alien world begins to show vital signs of coming back to life. For a brief instant, her consciousness shoots back into her body. Lying there on the wet, rocky ground of the alien world, looking up through her physical eyes again, at the doctor and co-pilot, she sees the resuscitation effort underway to save her. In this moment, Catherine realizes how the white light entity was trying to deceive her. I didn't see myself, she said. I was looking up at them. That's the real me, isn't it? Lying on the ground on that planet dying. And this is the hallucination. This isn't real. Her father begins to scowl, losing his patience, shouting, more denial. You're only making it harder on yourself. I'm trying to save you unnecessary pain. Catherine refuses to relent and notices, You're trying very hard to convince me to come with you. Why is that? If what you're saying is true, why not let me come to that decision on my own? My father would never act like this. He always believed I had to learn my own lessons, make my own mistakes. He never tried to shield me from life. Why would he try to shield me from death? You're not my father. I could be imagining you, but I don't think so. You have such a specific agenda. You're determined that I go with you somewhere. Who are you? 
Are you an alien being of some kind? Is that it? I was right. You're an alien. You created all these hallucinations, haven't you? Acknowledging his exposure, and finally admitting defeat, the entity explains, This is what my species does. At the moment just before death, one of us comes to help you understand what's happening, to make the crossing over an occasion of joy. And what is that? Catherine asks, pointing at the bright white light from which he appeared. Our matrix, he responds, where your consciousness will live. I was being truthful when I said it was a place of wonder. It can be whatever you want it to be. Shaking her head, she asks, Then why didn't you tell me this from the beginning? Why pretend to be my father? The entity disguised as her father reasons that usually people are comforted to see their loved ones. It makes the crossing over a much less fearful occasion. I've done this many times, but I've never encountered someone so resistant. Captain Janeway narrows her eyes in condemnation at the deceitful entity. I don't get the feeling you're trying to make me comfortable. You're only interested in my agreeing to come with you. You don't strike me as any kind of good Samaritan. You're more like a vulture, preying on people at the moment of their deaths when they're most vulnerable. What's the real reason you want me in that matrix? Somehow, I don't think it has anything to do with everlasting joy. In a last-ditch effort, the entity grabs her by the shoulders and demands, You must go with me. Unfazed, Captain Janeway makes the astute observation that, If you could force me to go, you'd have done it already. You need me to agree, don't you? I have to go voluntarily. Let me tell you this. We can stand here for all eternity, and I will never choose to go with you. With that, the entity concedes defeat, but warns her, You're in a dangerous profession, Captain. You face death every day. There will be another time, and I will be waiting. Eventually, you'll come into my matrix, and you will nourish me for a long, long time. This episode of Star Trek Voyager perfectly encapsulates the typical near-death deception experience. After being drawn towards a bright white light, entities often claiming to be deceased relatives present themselves as afterlife guides to help assist with their transition. They praise and hype the light as a place of overwhelming abundance, joy, and love beyond anything ever experienced on Earth. They patiently answer every question, clear up any confusion, then begin nudging the near-death experiencer towards entering the light. As Captain Janeway wisely notices, the entity pretending to be her father is unable to physically force her into the light. His only power is to mentally and emotionally deceive her so that she might choose the light of her own volition. Thus the entity cloaks himself in the body of the most loved and respected authority figure in Catherine's life. He relays stories and information that only her father should know to solidify the illusion. In order to scare her from waiting around in her disembodied state for too long, he warns about the agonizing loneliness and futility of staying. He insists the light is a place of joy and wonder where she can manifest anything she wishes. But when she finally adamantly refuses, the pretense of patience and understanding wears thin. The entity's forceful behavior exposes his cloak of compassion, and it becomes obvious that it is not actually her father. Like a pushy used car salesman trying to force an impulsive purchase, he gives false answers and makes false promises. If the white light was really worth the price of admission, why would it need these sleazy salesmen in their cheap meat suits to sell us on it? The entity's final comment gives the clearest clue when he says, eventually you'll come into my matrix and you will nourish me for a long, long time. In other words, our entry into the light seems to serve as some kind of energy extraction that feeds these entities. Similar to how Morpheus bleakly described the human condition in the Matrix movie, we may ultimately be nothing more than batteries farmed for a type of energy. And there you have the, uh, the movie reference, the, you know, the Matrix always kind of gets in there, doesn't it? And Ike has got onto this as well where he's putting forward this Morpheus idea that we're just batteries for these entities. And 
together with Ike and Eric pushing forward on, on this idea that that's the raison d'etre for the human being is really, uh, it doesn't sit right with me because as a clairvoyant, the spirits I've spoken to, my late father and my mother and my friends and relatives and all those who've gone before me, who I speak with, I'm not fooled by their presence because when you dwell with the higher realms, with the higher spirits and with the spirit of God and the Holy Spirit, you're never fooled again. You are in no doubt as to where you are. And, and it's easy for people outside of that paradigm to say, yeah, but it's all just fake. You know, it's just, you're just thinking that, you know, you've got this God experience because we have things like drugs that can mimic a plethora of human emotions and give you all these experiences. And, you know, there are all kinds of devices and mechanisms and psychologies to make you think and believe and to deceive you that way. Yes, if you're an idiot and if you are um, not a spiritualist medium who does the work of, of, the, of God and if you've never had the Holy Spirit come into your life, but once you have and you dwell in those higher realms with those higher spirits, you are never fooled again because what we teach is that it's all too easy to accept what they may say and that they are who they say they are. And this is the problem with mediums when they're developing is that, you know, the difference between the psychic and the spiritualist medium, like for instance, I'll give you an example just this week. My sister went to see a psychic medium, not a spiritual medium, but a psychic medium who told her everything about herself. And that's because in our auras, we carry all the information, the who, what, why, when, where, and how of, of ourselves. The soul body, it has organs and they're the chakras. So in the same way the physical body has the heart and the lungs and all those types of things, the soul body, the aspect of you, has those organs as well. And they're the chakras and meridians and all the submeridians, much more complicated than the physical body, the soul, by the way. You know, it's not just psychedelic blobs of things. It's also made up of auras. The mental and emotional aura is the one that is like a gloriosity around the head. And if you look in early Renaissance paintings, you see this nimbus gloriosity around the heads of saints. And it's been argued that the reason for that is um, maybe the artists like Leonardo and all the great masters we're able to see things that we weren't able to see, or maybe it's an echo of something that was visible before. But either way, it actually accurately represents the uh, mental and emotional aura. It gives indication as to the mental and emotional state of the individual. Then there is a, a crescent which goes almost from ear to ear, and that is the mental aspect of that nimbus gloriosity. And when it's in a kind of uh, decay or there's a problem, an imbalance, you'll see a split in that, like two semicircles split. From there, if we look at the spirit aura, that's the one that extends furthest from the body, about a foot and a half from the body. And that gives indication as to the spiritual nature of the individual. So when someone invades your space, say, they come too close, you might get an interference pattern between those two auras and you don't like that person being close to you it doesn't feel right you don't you might not even know the person but for some reason you just don't like them being close and that's because there's a kind of a disturbance or something in that aura a clash if you like so from there right we have a harmonic vibration where the ones that you love or people that you get along with and blend with there's a nice harmonic feeling and you you quite enjoy them being close to you you want them to be close to you and that's how you can immediately sense that part or that aspect of the aura. Now that aura cuts off the top of the head and just beneath the knee, which is why it is said in some philosophies, like in China, for instance, that dead people have no feet. Sometimes when you see a spirit through that aura, they'll appear to float. You also have an astral body, which is exactly the same as the physical body, except when you get to around about the age of 30, it stops aging. The spirit body, which is an exact copy, doesn't get ill. So the soul itself contains the blueprint for the physical body.
also within the soul and the auric energy. You carry with you a thing called sympathetic vibrations, and they are all the memories and everything you've ever done. It's your database, which is why sometimes when you blend with someone through that spirit aura, you get an indication as to a memory link or something that they may have done in the past. You may get friends and relatives and those who've gone before. You may get names and conditions and illnesses and all those types of things, including descriptions. But they are all things that exist within that person's aura. It's their database. And you as a sensitive may be just picking up on certain aspects of it. It's not necessarily a spirit communication. That's something else altogether. Okay, we're just looking at the psychic aspect of this aura. So this is the soul energy and where you pick up on these energies and conditions and everything that that person's ever been, including previous generations, you can pick up on. So it takes a medium to be able to differentiate between what they're picking up in that aura and what's coming from outside, from the spirit realm, connecting to your spirit aura as a medium. So it's a bit like an artist will paint a painting and it'll just come out of their imagination because the spirit get in touch with that part of the aura, that creative and inspirational part of the mind. And that's why you sometimes think it's your imagination, but it takes experience to know the difference between what comes from within and what comes from uh, an external source. There's an issue that my sister has with my father at the moment. So the medium has just picked up on how my father, my father's energy in her aura. <clears throat> my father may or may not have been there at the time of the reading. You see, I, I talked to my father and my mother. I talked to my, my sister and my brother. I talked to people who've passed over all the time. I have that conversation, and I don't see why other people can't. It's about having the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God with you to know that you are heard and that they are only separated from your vision by the thinnest of veils. And th these are things that Ike and Dubai and people like that really haven't got a clue about. They've never got up on a platform or been on a circuit for years or ran a spiritualist church and developed healing groups and um, ran spiritual awareness classes, working with auras and energies and working with um, spirits and going into places to rescue spirits and to meet entities from other interdimensional entities, shall we say, other stratas of the layer cake, if you like. Uh, so that they're, they're, they have a poverty of knowledge and language when it comes to these type of things. So they, they refer to Hollywood mechanisms like Star Trek, like The Matrix, which at the end of the day, I've got a lifetime in broadcast hundreds of hours to my credit, run the TV studios, what have you. What I can tell you is that these things are only scripts. It's fantasy, it's fiction, it's written by a human being. So in the Nag Hammadi library, uh, of which I've written a book called uh, Secrets of the Egyptian Nag Hammadi, which was published a couple of years ago. Welcome to Secrets of the Egyptian Nag Hammadi, Analysis and Revision and Retranslation, by Kevin Dermot O'Doherty. What follows is a series of segments from the book which is available in paperback, Kindle or audio formats, or can be ordered from all good bookstores. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Kevin Dermot O'Doherty has spent a quarter of a century studying these Egyptian codices that were found almost intact after the Second World War, near the Nile town of Nag Hammadi. These late antiquity texts hold consummate knowledge of the laws that govern the vertically integrated planes of matter, ether, and spirit, and how we are an integral part of creation, indeed, at the very center of it. These are the teachings of masters and exponents immersed in the understanding of auras, energies, spirits, demons, and other classes of interdimensional entities and the realms they occupy and control. And of the latter, they seek to give to us the gravest warning of Archon intrusion, their universal threat to us, and how these creatures emerged as a super-fantastic, super-intelligent anomaly from the bile of the original womb in the predominant form of both demons and ETs. In order to understand what is written, you must suspend much of what you think you already know, 
and any thoughts you may have about the order of the world and what many think of as its creator. In the interests of achieving greater clarity, it has been necessary to return to the original sources, specifically those of ancient Greek and Egyptian Coptic, to uncover their deeper truth, meaning and message for the world. From across the millennia, these writings will deliver on the promise they make to you if you are constituted to receive their message. According to the library, archons are the pre-existing, super-intelligent species to the human being. In several forms they are life-sucking entities who dominate, fashion, and maintain the lower etheric and material planes. They were tricked by Sophia, the virgin mother of the heavens, into making vessels that were to become the human body and soul, from the substances of matter and ether. They are variously credited with creating much of what we see, including the footstool of the earth. They replicated the human body and soul from matter and ether. Within the works, they are also described as space conquerors, and masters of space and time. They are acknowledged overall as history's omnipresent demonic entities and ETs, worshipped from the time of Atlantis by the ruling elites of our world right up to the present day. These texts are incendiary. They lift the lid on why our world is characterized by madness and insanity. They contain, in extraordinary detail, how the universe, the earth and the human being were formed and why we are here. Above all, these works are empowering. They give the reader the vision and understanding missing from so many other disciplines. Once you have read this book you will understand, as they did, specifically, the nature of the following. The human being, matter, ether, the soul, the spirit, demons, ETs, astrology, the meaning of the major arcana of the tarot, the Lucifer enigma, and what really happened in the Garden of Eden. Ultimately, these texts are filled with great power, gnosis, love, and beauty. They hold the key to great spiritual development and awareness for the inquirer. If you want to know more, then go to Kevin's YouTube channel, WFPCO, and click on his Nag Hammadi playlist. I've studied the Nag Hammadi text for 25 years, getting on for 26 years now. I haven't studied them year in, year out. I've, I've left them and come back to them. And one of the things, you know, people don't really, you get a lot of misinformation about what, what are in the Egyptian texts. So Jesus in uh, the Sophia Wisdom of Jesus, there's a very interesting scene in it where it's a seance on the Mountain of Joy. And Mary Magdalene, who is the physical medium, is omnipresent in most of these sorts of events. And she brings through the materialized form of Jesus. It, anyway, they ask him, how is the world formed? And Jesus says, and this is pertinent to the point I'm making, what I can tell you is that all humankind is born of the earth. It's material. Since the establishment of the world and to the present day, and though being of the earth, humankind has asked about God, who he is, and of his nature, and for all that asking still finds him elusive. Those blessed with the gifts of wisdom and insight have hypothesized on the organizing of the world and its progress, but their speculations have fallen short of the truth. Where philosophers are concerned, the organization of the world is focused in three ways, with none among them being of the same mind. For concerning the world, a number say it organizes itself. Others, it is organized by providence. Others, it is organized by fate and destiny, none of which are true. Jesus, in the next part, exposes the shortcoming of human consciousness and thought when he says, for well, these are all concepts that come from man. Basically, these are all merely the thoughts of men, like Star Trek episodes, like Hollywood movies. You must never lose sight of the fact that they are from the dream factory, that they are an illusion themselves. 
So here, Jesus informs them that he is the messenger, the revealer from and sanctioned by Sophia. Uh, whatever life is created from itself is spoiled by virtue of being self-made, meaning not of pure spirit. Providence is without wisdom. Fate cannot recognize, but you are provided with the opportunity to gain knowledge and whosoever be worthy of it, to them it will be given. But the point he's, he's making here is that whatever is created of the earth is of the earth, including the human being. Although we have within us a divine spirit, that we are ourselves divine spirit. We are tripartite and that we have a soul and we also have a physical body. Like, for instance, this piece of wood or these books, for instance, at one time, everything was pristine and now it's in an altered advanced state of decay and decrepitude dare i say we our bodies also made of matter age and decay in time so that's the world of matter that's the world that we know the one we navigate the one that we see we hold in our hands we put up on the shelf or we look at through these then you have an astral level which goes under a number of names. We'll call it the soul plane or the astral plane. And that is made of a substance called ether, which is not spirit. But unlike matter, it doesn't decay. It can change and alter. It's a medium, if you like. It can be made into things, but it doesn't fall apart. And that formed its own plane above the plane of matter. The soul is made of that matter. And then you have above that, the spirit plane, which is where we come from, which is the eternal, immortal, everlasting spirit, where dwells God and all the angels and all the higher things and things that don't corrupt, fall apart, decay or dissolve. Body, soul and spirit. You are the spirit. And you incarnate into the soul and the soul animates the physical body but also the spirit animates the soul which animates the physical body it's really quite simple we're in three parts it's not mind body and spirit it's spirit soul and body or body soul and spirit so the physical body has organs because it needs to function in a certain way. We need to breathe, we need to see, we have stereo vision, we have ears and we have internal organs that um, enable us to have an existence within this biosphere. All those things are common to all creatures, particularly mammals, say for instance, like cats and dogs and giraffes. And, you know, we, we all have the same sort of sets of organs, as it were, and we all share very, very similar DNA, but we are not apes and we are not cats or dogs or giraffes, okay? Yes, we have a body. We have a super advanced body, the best made body on the planet. Some creatures exceed us in certain ways, like the eagle has a better eyesight than us overall, things like that. You know, dogs have better hearing and senses of smell. Overall, we are the best made product. We have the, the far superior brain matter, and we have the, the, the best bodies, not the strongest bodies, but we are able to make and manufacture things and alter the world in which we exist. And that's the gift of the human spirit, by the way. So the world of matter, as it were, as, it, as we see it now, right, is that an aspect of what you call the Godhead. The world, the material world, is a lower creation of the Godhead or the last creation of the Godhead. Right, so we're actually in the spirit world now, but we're in the material aspect of it. Now then, we don't look for God um, and you know, through signs and wonders and those types of things. Instead, we see everything that we see as phenomena like this and you and me and everything else that we see as evidence of a creator. And that's the difference. The world of matter, you have a physical body, and that's the way that is, right? And that body is nothing other than a vehicle by which you navigate this material plane because it's made of the same stuff. Now, in the first apocalypse of James, which is in the Nakamadi Library, there's a very interesting scene where um, before entering Jerusalem, Jesus sits on a rock with James. It says, but James was timid and wept. 
and he was very distressed. They both sat down upon a rock, and Jesus said to him, James, thus you will undergo these sufferings, but do not be sad, for the flesh is weak. It will receive what has been ordained for it. But as for you, do not be timid or afraid. Now, in the tripartite human, what we're told from the Nag Hammadi Library is that the, the human body and the soul were sabotaged by the archons. The archons are the pre existent um, species to the human being. We basically are an improvement on them. <clears throat> they are merely made of ether and matter. Super intelligence, they are fashioners and maintainers of the physical and etheric world. So in the beginning, back in the garden story, they entered the Adam creature and sabotaged the matrix of his human soul and put in there negative traits of fear, jealousy, anger, revenge, all those kind of things, whereas Sophia as a challenge or a counterpoint to them of love and forgiveness and understanding, the virtues of the soul, if you like, against the seven deadly sins. So, And you also have seven chakras. Don't forget, so these are important numbers to remember. So that's what Jesus means when he says about the physical body will receive what has been ordained for it. And what the texts teach you is that the archons weaken the body and the soul with these drives that are very difficult for us as human beings to overcome. Feelings of avarice, insatiable greed and uh, anger, and including sexual drives and things that, that really destroy the spirit of the human being. Okay. The spirit of the human being can be considered pure, yet interlinked to a vehicle called the soul, which is made of an inferior substance called shadow. The shadow can deliver the spirit down to the abyss or up to the realm of the higher, dependent on the desires present within its complex and subtle matrix. The spirit is the ultimate control, yet the soul and its negative energies and traits can ultimately determine its destiny. Meaning, it can be very difficult for the human spirit to override the harmful desires of the soul and the needs of the physical body to which it is attached by a silver umbilical cord. And coming back to the psychic who was working with my sister, wasn't a spiritual medium. They were just a psychic medium because my father wouldn't upset my sister that way from the other side of life. My father wasn't, that wasn't in his nature, shall we say. And it's not part of the code of the spirit, the eyes of the soul. It's not how it works. So a bit like a musician where wrong notes are being played, you can tell when it's out of tune. So the medium is able to, the psychic medium on a psychic level, is able to pick up on these things, the outcome of events already set in motion. So they may describe how your parents look, for instance how they looked on the earth plane, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your parent is present in the room at that time. Whereas the spiritual message from the spiritual medium as a strong contact brings evidence, and it's not proof all the time. Sometimes it's proof, but it's more along the lines of strong evidence. They also bring a reason for coming, and then they tidy up their message. It's called the CERT principle. Contact evidence, reason for coming, and tata. So psychic mediums on the psychic level can do quite a lot of damage. In fact, I've written a chapter on this in the new book, um, True Files from the Medium's Casebook, and the chapter is called Bopar at Waterloo, where a psychic medium completely got stuff wrong and caused a lot of trouble and a lot of damage. and. The only reason I booked that medium was because she was popular and everyone wanted her. And in fact, I have to cancel that medium because people don't want to know about the truth about the difference between psychic and spiritual mediumship. 
and what it means in terms of psychic science because they don't want to know that. They just think, well, you know, you cancel that medium. She was bloody good. We like her. You know, and you, you kind of get all that crap, you know. Uh, she was popular. The, the church was a business as well, so you had to bring money in. So I knew if I booked her, and I'm just being mercenary here, that we could cover our costs that week. You know, sometimes that's the way it is. It's a series of dishonorable bargains when it comes to the energy of money and finance. But nonetheless, I make absolutely no apology for it. Um, we have to put bread on the table and we had to keep the church going. So as a beacon of light and uh, sometimes those mediums, you, you have a way of kind of getting rid of them off the books, if you know what I mean. But they do cause a lot of trouble. That's all I can say. So the psychic often is it doesn't really understand what's going on by virtue of simply operating on an etheric level rather than a spiritual one. So in this scene, when you pass over, Jesus is telling you how to deal with the archons of deception. And in particular, Jesus says, three of them will seize you. They who sit there as toll collectors, not only do they demand toll, but they also take away souls by theft. When you come into their power, as I have even as a spiritual medium, one of them who is their guard will say to you, Who are you? Or where are you from? You are to say to him, I am a son, and I am from the Father. And he will say to you, What sort of son are you? And to what father do you belong? You are to say to him, I am from the pre-existing father and the son of the pre-existing one. Now, some of the text is um, missing there. So there's gaps. So I'm going to, because I've studied the text for so long, there's gaps in the text. And I'm going to fill them in here. Basically, what, what you then say to the archons of deception is that you come from the pre-existing God and not the abomination that made you and that you are going home, that you might pass. Because if you answer wrong, you can be sent to another realm. They, they, they can trick you, you see. They are soul jackers and they do have a dominion and a power that can be very difficult to resist. Now, you, you can overcome these things, but that's dependent. Most people as normies can't do it because... You know, you're so wrapped up in the material world. You've never sat for development. You're not constituted in the right way, and you're not bothered about it anyway. So, you know, the, the spirit world and the lower nightmare realms are shock with souls who made mistakes. And here it's interesting that it talks of alien things. You are to say to him, they are not entirely alien, but they are from Akamoth, who is the female, and these she produced as she brought down the race from the pre-existing one. Brought down the race, meaning sabotaged the soul. Akamoth is um, Yaldabaoth, or the Demiurge's version. It's the daughter of the Demiurge, lower vibration. And a lot of people in these texts make a completely wrong reading of the Gnostic text in that they call about this is the fall of Sophia and the lower Sophia. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. They really don't know what they're talking about. People like John Lamb Lash. Um, and when it, whenever you hear anyone in respect of the Gnostic text talk about the fall of Sophia, they do not know what they are talking about because I've read all the texts um, and six of them I've studied quite extensively. I've retranslated and... Uh, you know, I've um, revised them within a psychic and spiritual framing, which is what they need because they are awash with all that. And the thing is, is that the, in, nowhere, in no way does it say anywhere about a fall of Sophia. So then it says, so these archons, are they not alien? But they are ours, and in a way, it's kind of alluding to them being uh, we're, we're similar to them in that we're anthropoid. They are indeed ours because she who is the mistress of them is from the pre existent one, 
At the same time, they are called alien because the pre-existent one did not have intercourse with her when she produced them. When he also says to you, where will you go? You are to say to him, to the place from which I have come, there shall I return. And if you say these things, you will escape their attacks. But when you come to these three detainers who take away souls by theft in that place, you are a vessel much more than them. You are made of a light. But I shall call upon the imperishable knowledge, which is Sophia, who is in the father and who is the mother of Akamoth. So you see, Akamoth really is uh, the Demiurge's daughter, and she's modeled in a negative way on Sophia. So really, I don't don't really quite understand um, why Eric Dubay is really on this deception thing. Because when you die, it's natural. Everyone dies, right? It's a natural thing. We can't escape it. Well, he's kind of put up that it's some kind of deception or something terrible is going to happen to you. And there's enough fear in the world, and that's what the Archons want you to think is to be afraid of death, so you'll do what they say. Well, you know, uh, it, it puts a fear stratagem into the human being. So a lot of these things that I can relate to because, you know, I, I've got close to death, and I speak from experience. Just last year, I suffered two brain hemorrhages, and uh, I almost died. I was found 18 hours later. I haven't crashed my car on a mountain in South off the coast of Southwest Ireland on an island called Valencia on Gokorn Mountain. And I was found and I, I, I met with uh, a clan of wraiths and they came to collect me as deceivers and they wanted me to go with them. And they were showing me this light and that it could be very easy for me to go over. But I said to them, I come from the pre-existent one. You're not the messengers. You're, you are not the, the means by which I enter the spirit world. And that's what they are. They are deceivers. Unfazed, Captain Janeway makes the astute observation that if you could force me to go, you'd have done it already. So they can't force you. They are quite pathetic creatures, really. Um, so, don't, I mean, it's difficult to get into this. The, the main raison d'etre of, of this video is um, really just to challenge Eric Dubay, who I do actually admire, you know, he put himself out there. And I get where Ike's coming from and people like that who try to bring the truth, but they do not have a monopoly on the truth. Um, they are not the voice of reason. And, uh, you know, the world wasn't given to them. So just bear that in mind that, as it says in the Sophia Wisdom of Jesus, all these things, including what I'm saying to you now, merely thoughts of a man. All these things are merely my thoughts, and I'm a human being. I understand that I, I'm f a flawed product, that I don't have a monopoly on the truth, that I'm not the voice of reason. But I think it's, it's worth pointing out where these things come from a higher authority in terms of the likes of the Nakamadi Library, which is the preeminent library, clearly written by people who are extremely clever and really understood about the vertical integration of the planes and how auras and energies work, interdimensional things, and how the afterlife works and where we come from, who we are, and where we're going. So without further ado, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, friends, and thank you very much. If you liked that video, click like, subscribe, leave a comment in the comments section, because, friends, it's more important now than ever that our voice is heard, especially with growing censorship. Thank you for watching. Until next time.